My name is Sid Haas. I'm the Vice President of Business Development here at LKCS, and I want to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on designing your website for a better user experience. For those of you not familiar with our company, I do have one slide that introduces the, the, the company to you. LKCS was founded back in 1961, and we focus on serving the needs of community-based financial institutions. We provide a wide variety of marketing solutions across all media um, and all channels. Um, and really our focus for the last 15 years or so has been on utilizing data to improve our clients' marketing results. And certainly a lot of our solutions, you know, focus on the, the digital space and uh, web development is a huge piece, you know, of, of what we do along with all electronic marketing and tying that in with traditional marketing. Um, you know, and statements and, you know, again, all sorts of omni-channel campaigns. But as we talk about user experience, I think it's important, obviously, to define what that means. Everybody kind of has a different take on it. It's, it's a big buzzword out there. And to me, I guess user experience or UX, as it's commonly referred to, um, you know, is really any, inter any interaction, you know, that someone has with a product or service. But for the purpose of today's webinar, we're really focusing on people's interactions with websites and how we can improve, you know, the experience that people's have that people have with websites. And when we talk about UX design, UX design really focuses on every element of a website or a web page to improve that experience and how it makes people feel when they're on your website and how it how easy is it for someone to accomplish the task that they're trying to perform, you know, on that website, whether it's getting information, filling out a form, you know, whatever they're trying to do on your site, how easy is it for them to do? How does it make them feel? Um, and we want to improve that experience as best we can. The goal, obviously, is to create an easy, efficient, relevant, and pleasant experience for anybody that generates a positive result. In most cases, that's going to be revenue, right? We want to generate business, but in some cases, it's not revenue. So there's a gentleman named Peter Morville, who's a very well-known user experience expert, and he created a honeycomb that I think really breaks down um, UX or user experience very well into several chunks. And we'll actually use these chunks in each segment of this honeycomb um, throughout the webinar today. So the first chunk is useful, right? We want to make sure that the website is useful. And we do that by providing original content that fulfills a need. The second piece of the honeycomb is that the website is usable. It must be easy to use, right? That makes sense. The third one is that it's desirable, right? We have, we focus on design in this section. Design elements evoke emotion and appreciation. That it's findable. Information on the website is, you know, needs to be navigable and locatable. It's accessible, it must be accessible to people with disabilities. And lastly, that the website is credible. Users must trust and believe what you tell them on the website. And all of those components together make your website valuable. So we're going to focus on each of these areas on this honeycomb as we explore how to improve each of these areas to improve the user experience of a website. So we'll start with useful. And useful is really all about content because content drives the user experience. And honestly, content is probably, in many cases, the area that people, people spend the least amount of time on, or certainly less time than needs to be spent. Um, first part about content is that you need to make it easy to digest. Content needs to be readable, understandable, and most importantly, easy to scan. Because really, attention spans have been really considerably reduced. And I blame it primarily on the phone. Right? Nobody reads anymore. So skimming has replaced reading. And content needs to be as impactful as the design. So you need to tell stories. You need to tell visitors what your brand stands for. 
need to explain how your products and services will benefit them. You need stories to move people to action. There are so many websites that we look at that literally you can change the logo at the top of that website. And it can apply, and it can apply to that other business just as well as it can to the business that we're looking at. And that's not the type of website that you want to design for yourself. You want to tell a story about you. You want to have language and, and you know content and design and everything else that's unique to you, and not you know that you can literally just change the colors and the logo, and and you know have it just as easily apply you know, to another bank or credit union down the street. And we'll show examples of how you can do that. Every page needs a clear structure. So every page needs a headline, right? If it's a product page, use the name of the product. If it's a landing page, use the link text that led to it. What, what are people expecting that page to be about, right? Every page needs a subheading. If it's a product page, make that subheading a single sentence description of what that product is. If it's a landing page, make that a summary of what the visitor is going to receive, you know, as a result of that offer or whatever that landing page is about. Every, pro every page needs a benefits summary. Now, these are benefits. What are the benefits to the person about that product? Not features at this point, these are benefits. Landing page should be the benefits of the user taking the desired action. Landing pages are all about driving people to action. So what are the benefits that that person is going to receive from taking that action? Now every page needs a feature summary as well, but these are only on product pages. Landing pages don't necessarily need features, but product pages need features that include more details about that product or service. And every page needs calls to action. These are the actions that visitors can take, such as opening an account or subscribing to your newsletter. You know, and a landing page typically will only have one desired action that you want that visitor to take because you're driving them down one specific path. So let's look at a page. Right. This is a segment, a summary of one page from, you know, one of our customers It happens to be First Florida. So most of the examples that I'm going to show you today are all going to have a link. So you'll be able to view these, you know, after the webinar and, you know, take, <laughs> you know, be able to, to, I guess, just dissect them on your own. But you'll see that this page has a headline at the top. Welcome to our auto buying center. It has a subheading, right? It has benefits copy. I personally think the benefits copy could be better on this page. It certainly has features, but it really doesn't focus on the benefits. I think that this page could actually be improved with more benefits. What are the benefits that, you know, in this case, you know, members would receive by getting an auto loan? But it does have some clear calls to action, right? They've got some buttons at the top. They've got a nice little calculator right here at the bottom, and then they've got some text links as well that are all very clear calls to action, not overpowering, but however, you know, the, the visitor to this website might want to get more information. It's clearly not a dead end for them. There, there's ways for them to continue on the process of, of finding out more about auto loans. So as we talk about content, we have a little checklist for you to go through. So what is the promise of the page? Does it deliver on that promise? If it doesn't, go back and rewrite that page, right? Rewrite the content for that page. Imagine what questions visitors have that led them to the page that you're looking at. Are you answering those questions? You know, if it's that auto loan page that we just looked at, what might somebody be looking for what information might somebody be searching for about an auto loan? Are you providing that information? You know, sometimes you might have to split that page into more than one page, you know, especially because we're, again, we're trying to keep this copy scannable. Is your voice all about your institution or all about your visitor? Because again, we want to talk about benefits in addition to features. So stop saying we and start saying you in your content. Is your content easy to look at? 
is it skimmable? I've said this word several times, but can your readers find the bit of information that they need? Making copy skimmable isn't necessarily making it shorter. It's breaking it down into smaller chunks. So you can still have longer pages, and we'll talk about that again, but it's really just making sure that you're breaking it down with the use of subheadings and sections and bullets and different things like that to make sure that it's skimmable. How complex is your language, right? Is it full of jargon? Banking is full of acronyms and jargon. And, you know, if it's difficult for people to understand, <laughs> then you need to edit it. Do you have one call to action or do you have a lot of them that compete with each other? What do you want your users to do next? And maybe you have too many of those calls to action. Maybe you need to simplify it. Drive people to really what you want them to do, but still provide enough. You know, there's, there's, there's ways to have too few calls to action. There's ways to have too many. So there is a balance in there. And again, we're going to talk about that as we go through too. And if it's a product page, do you actually describe the product? So we'll jump to usability, right? And usability allows people to easily accomplish their goals, whatever they're trying to complete. Whatever tasks they're trying to complete on your website, we want to make sure that the web pages are usable. And the winner here is Google, right? We've all seen this page. It is the simplest web page there is. Everybody knows what to do. You type your search term in the box, you hit enter, or you hit the search, and you get your search results, right? Everybody's seen it. Everybody uses it. And you know what? It works. Because if you've sat in on any of my online marketing presentations, you've probably seen a slide similar to this. In the U.S., Google controls 88.6% of the U.S. engine search market share. 88.6%. I mean, the other search engines, they might as well not even be around. So when it comes to <laughs> so usability matters. I mean, usability matters. And, and why does Google have that kind of you know, market share is because it works. Users find the information that they're looking for. You know, Google didn't happen to design the page that way just because they wanted to. They figured out very early on that having a page like that works. So let's learn from that. Let's make our pages and our websites easy and intuitive because simple interfaces help users accomplish their tasks. So the first piece of that is having an intuitive design. We need to provide a nearly effortless understanding of how that site is built, how people get around, right? And we'll show examples. But we also need to make the site learnable, meaning that first time people that come to the site need to be able to look at that site and understand right off the bat what they need to do. We need to make it efficient. We need to be able to reduce the time and effort required for experienced users to complete tests. So when people come back, how are they going to remember, right? How are they going to make it more efficient to complete their tasks? And then when it comes to remembering things, we want to make things memorable. So will users that come back remember how to use your site in future visits? How do we make it so that they don't have to relearn things? They've learned it the first time. So how are they going to remember? So how, what are the tips and tricks to doing that. And how do we prevent errors? So how do we design our site to help users avoid making mistakes? And then when they do, or when we generate errors accidentally, how do we help users recover from them? And these are all part of usability. And lastly, is satisfaction. Obviously, we want people to enjoy that experience, right? We talked about that. We want them to find value in the site because people that enjoy their experience are going to drive those conversion rates. These are the people that are going to apply for our loans and open our accounts and request information and do the things that we want them to do on our websites. So some usability tips for you. First of all, users will scroll down pages as long as, as it's clear that there's additional information that's what we call below the fold. Just don't make your pages too long. You know, you don't want to have, you know, oodles and oodles and oodles of information on a page, but you don't have to worry about fitting everything into just what you can see on the screen. But you do want to make sure it's obvious that there's information that people can scroll down to. And mobile is a must. 
You know, if your website is not responsive, in other words, if it doesn't adjust to fit a phone or a tablet, then it's time for you to redesign your site. Because what we're seeing over and over again is that 50% or more of your visitors are using mobile devices. You also have to make sure that mobile interface elements, in other words, buttons and menus and things like that, that they're easy for people to click on. If they're hard to tap, if they're too small or too close together, then you need to adjust those because, you know, <laughs> phones especially, they're pretty small. So we need to make sure that those interface elements are easy to use. Icons are useful. Everybody, not everybody, but most people really like icons. And they help people recall functionality. So when it comes to that memorability and that usability, they're helpful. But remember to label them. So I'll show you some examples here in a second. But remember to have those text labels underneath those icons or next to those icons. And watch your analytics. So, you know, we have, we see it all the time where customers don't look at their analytics or, you know, prospective customers don't necessarily know, you know, what pages are popular or not popular, what features on those pages are being used. If there's things on your pages that aren't being used, take them off. Because they're, they're just elements that don't need to be there. They're taking people's attention away from the content that they want to see. So when we talked about icons and labeling your icons, here are some examples. So off the glance, you don't necessarily know with the examples on the left, unless you mouse over them, what those icons are. When you label them, you can tell what they are. Now, I obviously, you know, with a mouse over, if you mouse over them, you'll know what they are because, you know, in a lot of cases, the designers will have built them so that the you know, the, the mouse over will show, you know, the wording then. And on a mobile device, in most cases, the labels are already there. So if you're designing it in mobile with the labels already there, why aren't you designing it in desktop that way? And if you do any type of search for icon usability, you'll find all of the, uh, all the documentation to support the fact that labels should always be shown with icons. So more usability tips for you is that testing isn't difficult. There's all sorts of ways to test usability. I mean, there's heat maps and there's all sorts of fancy usability testing. But if you read all the documentation, what you'll find is that you sit down with five different users and have them use your website, use your calculators, use your form, whatever page you're trying to test. You'll find that five users will turn up 85% of any issues with the page. They're not going to find 100%, but they'll find 85% of the problems. And then from there, obviously, you can do additional testing. But a simple test with five people sending them a link and saying, hey, can you use this page and report any, any, <laughs> any issues that you find? They're going to turn up 85% of the problems. Forms are an extremely important place to measure the efficiency of an interface, right? We know that forms and applications are critically important to conversions, right, and the things that we want people to do. So we need to design them appropriately. We need to make them easy. And I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about. But we want to make sure that we spend extra time and effort to make our forms friendly to use. Here's a tip for you with forms. Get contact information up front. Get people to put in their name and their phone and their email address first, because from the retail side of things, cart abandonment's a huge problem, right? You put products in your shopping cart and you leave before you buy the product. And that store doesn't know who you are. Well, guess what? The same thing happens with loan applications. And the same thing happens with account you know, applications. But if you can get that contact information up front and, you know, they started a loan application or an account application or a membership application or whatever that form is, and you save that information, you have the ability to follow up and reach out to that person and say, hey, Sid, you know, it looks like you may have started this loan application. Is there something we can help you with? If you didn't get that contact information, you've got no way to follow up with me. So here's an example for you. This is an actual loan application, right? From a pretty well-known vendor that's out there. It's not that nice to look at, especially on mobile where it gets cut off on the right-hand side. 
not too friendly. Some people might fill it out. Some people might look at that and say, whoa. Right? But if I really wanted an auto loan, I'd probably go through and fill it out. But it's just not friendly to look at. And like I said, on a phone, it's pretty, really very difficult to use. It's tiny. You know, I mean, it's, bl <laughs> it's blown up here pretty large. But it's really small and really difficult to use on a phone. So, if, you know, most people looking at that on a phone would just run away. The exact same loan application on the exact same system for a... <laughs> Another financial institution looks just like this. This is the same vendor. So I don't understand. I don't know if it's just newer or they have a different package or what it is, but it's the same vendor has the same loan application available like this. So is it just that the one financial institution has to make a phone call and say, hey, update it to this? Or, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know, but these are the, it's the same vendor. Which of these two loan applications are you more likely to complete? One looks a lot friendlier, a lot easier. They're just the fact that I'm not presented with all of the fields and I have that continue makes it a little bit easier. Now, again, my recommendation would be to have the contact information at the beginning. So again, if somebody were to abandon that application, I'd at least have the contact information, but still this design is much friendlier to me. It's much <laughs> more appealing for me to complete this application than the previous one. So a usability checklist for you is can visitors quickly, like in two seconds or less, tell what you do when they land on your site. What do you do? Can they tell that from your homepage? Can they find information or products easily? And we'll talk about navigation as well as we go through. Is your company logo linked to your homepage? We get, we get this question a lot, like, well, you know, we don't think we should do that. We want the word home. It's, it's a standard now. Everybody expects your logo to link to your homepage. So do it. Is your site responsive? If it's not, it's time to redesign, period. Flat out, there's, it's not even a question anymore. Do your pages load quickly? People don't wait for you. Are the most important elements of your site visible without scrolling down or from side to side? Now, again, people will scroll down to get more information, but the most important elements that you want them to see should be visible. Does your site look good when viewed with all the most popular web browsers? Test it. And are ads and pop-ups unobtrusive? Occasionally an ad here or there, a pop-up here and there isn't too bad, but if you've got pop-ups on every page, people are just gonna get frustrated and leave. They're gonna disappear on you, right? We've all seen those video pop-ups on certain sites and they drive us crazy. So, <laughs> you know, we've seen the gated content and I get into these you know, conversations with customers all the time. Once in a while, it's okay. But if you start, you know, requiring people to put in contact information, you know, to, to visit certain pages, it's going to drive a lot of people away. So sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's not okay. There's a balance there. Let's talk about making sure that content is findable because people don't come to your website to play hide and seek. They don't have the patience to, to find information that's not easy to find. So when it comes to navigation, we want to make sure that you always have an obvious way to access the navigation menu. So consider using a sticky menu, especially on long web pages. What that means is a menu that follows you down the page as you scroll down, right? It moves along with you. And don't hide login or search features inside the menus. Keep those above your menu so that they're always visible. People use your site search. Apparently, over 50% of your users use your search function, not drop downs or side navigation. This was a number that shocked me when I was when I, when I found it. I didn't know that either. But 50% of your users use the search, not drop downs or side navigation. So a lot of people don't even go to your navigation menu. They're just looking for your search. So if you don't have a search, add one. And if you have it, make sure it's prominently located. 
because 34% of your visitors will leave if that search is unsuccessful. And what's interesting is that quote unquote buyers are the people that are going to complete, you know, the actions that you want them to complete, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're 91% more likely to use search functions than just people that are browsing for information. So that site search is really important. So here's some screenshots for you, just to show you some different styles of navigation that I think are particularly friendly, that I think give you a really good experience, you know, for the user. This site has a lot of pages, but I think they've done a really good job of breaking down the navigation to make it something that's really friendly and easy to use. And again, you can see the search function is very accessible, the login function is very accessible, and they're making the navigation features very, very easy to use, even with a site that has a lot of pages. Here's another example. Again, these are mega style menus, but I'll show you some that aren't. When I mean mega menus, these are ones that basically stretch the width of the website. You know, but again, the search function is called out. The online banking is also very, very easy to find on this site if you load it. Here's one that's not a mega menu, but again, I think the menus are, are you know, super easy to find. Very, very easy to find the information, you know, on this site. So we need calls to action in this menu. Search is on the top left in this case. Makes it easy to navigate. Search engine optimization is also part of findability because people, we want to be able to make sure that people can find information when they're not on your site, but they're looking for it off of your site. So, you know, search engine optimization is about improving your position in those organic search results, right? And it's, 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 it's what we call a digital marketing strategy with no end because, you know, Google in particular changes their search algorithms more than once daily. So you're going to have to constantly refine your search engine optimization techniques to continue to improve, continuously improve your search positioning. But your goal is to really be on the first page of search results for key search terms, for those key products and services in your market. And you have to realize it's, it's impossible to get there for everything, you know, unless you truly have an unlimited budget. And if you do, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> but it's about content and coding. It's about the content on your pages and continuously improving the content on those pages and even having specialized pages for, you know, very specific content, you know, blogs and all sorts of things. And it's about coding. It's about the code behind those pages, making sure that everything's properly structured in that code, you know, to really optimize it, you know, for Google's algorithms. And, and it is, it's a process. It's a long-term process. It's a long-term commitment. It's not something that can happen overnight. And it's, it's one of those things that just continues, you know, it's, it's continuous improvement and incremental improvement, um, you know, over time for those different products and services to, to really, you know, make the most of it. But findability is also about organization. It's about organizing your content, organizing your pages, and different things like that. So when we look at content on pages, you want to make sure that related links that you're showing on your pages are relevant to what users need, and you want to limit those number of related links at five to seven at most. But you also want to look at potentially integrating product finders or filters into your content pages. And I'll show you what I mean by that. But you want to give users tools to find the products that fit them the best. So, for example, and I always pick on my son for this because he seems to have he, he seems to get a new pair of shoes seemingly every every week. But when he's shopping for pairs of shoes, you know, or if you were shopping for a pair of shoes, you would filter them by style. Right? Are you searching for, you know, a pair of athletic shoes or dress shoes or, you know, casual shoes? What types of shoes are you looking for? What size of shoes? What color? You know, what heel height? What, are, what, how are you going to filter those down? But the same thing is true for certain financial products and services. So not every, not every product or service needs you know, a product finder, but if you think of the number of checking accounts that some, you know, of our clients have, our mortgage accounts, for example, you can start to see why it's difficult for people to really determine which one is best for them. And there's tools that you can consider adding 
or ways that you can help people figure out which product is best for them. So I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about. Here's a site that I think does a really, really good job with their related links. I think <laughs> they're clear calls to action, and they're also, these are the things that are most relevant to people on this auto loan page. What are these people going to be looking for? Well, these are the things that they might be looking for. So they call it out appropriately. There's not too many of them. You know, we're not going to have people staring at this like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, just analysis paralysis, right? There's not too many. So it's, you know, it's a good number of links. Easy for me to understand what I'm going to click on, and boom, I can go there. And here's an example of a product finder for a mortgage, right? So I've kind of shown you the process, but in this case, are you looking to purchase a refinance? And I would have clicked on purchase in this case, so it highlights it blue. I click on purchase. It then takes me to, well, do you want, what type of mortgage are you looking for? A fixed rate or an adjustable? I'm not sure. So I mouse over these. It gives me a description. Okay. So I click on, you know, one of those and, well, what type of property is this? Is this your primary residence or a second home or a rental or investment property? Well, it's my primary residence. Okay, great. Well, how much do you want to put down? Well, do you have 15% or more or less than 15? Well, I've got my 15% that I'm going to put down. And this is great. It looks like you're ready to buy a home. Here's your rates. You know, you can view all of our mortgage rates. You can apply. You have a question. You can request a consultation. You know, I might question the placement of this button. You know, it might be a little bit better if it was right here. It might be a little bit more obvious. But, you know, I think this is a great way to really drive people to understand which product is best for them in a difficult situation or a difficult, you know, decision. Um, really, really fantastic, I think, product finder. Simple. Didn't take me any amount of time you know, five or six clicks to really drill down to my specific situation, shows me the information that I need, gives me, you know, three or four relevant, you know, courses of action that I can take. And then there I go. You know, I'm off to the, I'm off to the races with my ability to apply or get in touch, you know, with somebody at this institution. Here's another example, you know, of, of kind of relevant links on a homepage. I love this little how can we help you section, you know. It's clear. It's simple. You know, I can see so, some rates, obviously, you know, so just real quick navigation. But this little how can we help you section, you know, with the six things that, you know, is probably the majority of, of things that somebody's coming to the homepage for other than online banking, um, you know, it's real quick and easy to find. So when it comes to findability, you want to make sure that, you know, is your navigation clear and consistent throughout the site? You don't want to have different styles of navigation in different sections or different pages. You want to keep it clear and consistent throughout the entire site. Do you have a site search? Is it easy to access? If you don't have one, I would suggest that you consider adding one. Are the numbers of buttons and links on your pages and within your navigation menus reasonable? You know, if you've got more than, say, three tiers or so of navigation, you really might want to consider redesigning that navigation structure because it's going to be difficult for people to get through. Are text links underlined? Are they easy to identify? You know, because people are expecting that, right? It's one of those things that's just, it's a given. Are navigation labels clear and concise? In other words, the navigation menus you know, are the titles of those navigation menus and the links within those navigation menus, are, are they clear? Do people know what the pages are, you know, before they click on those, on those menu items? Are related links relevant to the visitor? So let's jump into desirable. How do we create enjoyable online experiences through design? So Apple's famous for this, right? This is how Apple made and Steve Jobs at Apple <laughs> turn this company around through design. And one of his famous quotes is design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. 
And it's the same thing with your website. Design is how your website works, not just what it looks like. So we're going from usability to a desired experience because desirability triggers want. People make purchases to satisfy desires, right? People's emotions are a hugely important factor in decision making. And design influences the perceived value in your products and services. And again, if you don't think that's true, just think of Apple. Because people pay a premium for Apple's products, right? There's questions, there's debate you can have about whether pro Apple's products are better than their competitors or not. But there's really not much debate about whether Apple's design is better or not. It's better. And you're paying that additional price for the better design. So when it comes to great visual design, an irresistibly attractive design plays a huge role in impressing your users and definitely drives conversion, right? So we want to make sure we have that irresistibly attractive design. Now, design is in the eye of the beholder, so everybody has a different style of design. So I'm not here to tell you exactly what makes a great design, because it changes too, right, with the times. What was a great design five years ago isn't a great design today. But typography, colors, icons, illustrations, images, they should all communicate your brand personality and contribute contribute to the feel of your products and services. Again, remember what I said earlier. If I can look at your website and stick another banks or credit unions logo at the top, then you're not doing a great job, either with your content or with <laughs> or with your design. We want to make sure that we're, we're communicating your brand with both the language and the content and the design. Your layout, your headings, and your styles must be consistent site-wide. And the colors have the same meaning. So you don't want to use red headers on one page and red links on another and red text somewhere else. If you're going to use red headers on one page, use red headers everywhere. So you don't, you don't want to start mixing that up because it's just going to confuse people. So some design guidelines for you. With colors, you don't want to use too many. The Handbook of Computer Human Interaction recommends using a maximum of five colors. So I'm not going to tell you you can't use six, and I'm not going to tell you, you know, but, you know, this, this, which has been around for a while, this handbook recommends using a maximum of five colors. And with typefaces, you want to make sure they're legible. There's a lot of debate about whether you should use sans serif typefaces or serif typefaces. I, I'm not going to debate that, but like colors, you don't want to use too many. I would say I would suggest using a maximum of three different typefaces, and you don't want to use too many sizes either, because it just it just mucks up the page. And graphics don't just add graphics because you want to add a graphic. Make sure that a graphic or a photo really helps that users complete a task or understand content. If it's not adding value to the page, decide if you need it or not. Some design practices for you is make sure that every page is designed with a visual hierarchy. Organize elements so that people really gravitate towards the most important elements first. You want to drive people towards your calls to action. But you want to make that feel natural and enjoyable. You don't want to have something flashing at them, like click here. <laughs> you know, you want them to obviously get the content and absorb the content, but then just flow naturally towards that button, you know, to request information or apply or whatever that call to action is that you want them to take. And you want to make sure that you obviously employ the typical conventions that people are used to. Keep that navigation at the top or left side of your site. Again, have your logo at the top or left, or excuse me, at the top left or center of the page. Make sure that logo links to your homepage like we talked about. You know, change the color of links when people mouse over them. You know, those are the typical conventions in websites that people are used to. So 
keep with that. There's no reason to break what's not broken or to change what's not broken, right? So here's some examples of some sites that I think just have real clean, friendly designs that I think do a good job of that. I, I'm not here to tell you what makes a great design, but I think these are just, you know, good design experiences, I would say. So very clean, very friendly, again, skimmable content, but design that has that natural flow that we're talking about. Good use of color, good use of type styles, you know, graphics that aren't, you know, distracting from the page. It's a good use of an ad, not something that is distracting me away, you know, things like that. So here's a, a page again that's, I think, structured very, very well. You know, the heading at the top is embedded in this graphic that, you know, again, leads, gives me information about what this page is about. Clear heading, you know, a nice style to the subheading, a nice style to these little bulleted, you know, points on the page. A couple of real quick, clear calls to action. Just makes it a real friendly, you know, good user experience on this particular page. Leads us to the next little segment of our honeycomb, which is all about accessibility, making websites accessible for people with disabilities. And good news here for most of the people is that you guys are all well aware of this, right? Financial institutions have been dealing with this for a couple of years now. So we know that people with disabilities must be able to use websites effectively and that all users must be able to perceive and understand and navigate and interact with and contribute to web to the web. And the websites must provide equal access and equal opportunity to people with disabilities. I could spend an hour just on this topic alone, in which we have, right? And it sounds easy, right, to do this until we realize how people with disabilities use the web. So we need to make sure that our websites are designed for keyboard compatibility. We need to make sure that we're using video captions that we have large links, buttons, and controls, and that we, you know, are designing for voice recognition. So again, you know, these are things that make, make our websites better for everybody because not all users are equally tech savvy or financially literate. So when it comes to forms, we need to make sure that we're providing clear notifications and feedback, right? When they, you know, when there's a required field in a form or some type of way that we have to enter information in that form properly. Let's not give them some bizarre error code that nobody understands. We need to make sure that we're designing, you know, with colors that have appropriate contrast. We need to design with a clear layout and design. We need to, design, you know, write our content that's understandable. That all improves usability, which all leads back to, you know, a better user experience. So there's, you know, you've all heard this most likely, but there's the web content accessibility guidelines that you need to follow. They've been developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. They're not new. Version 2 has been out since December 2008, and version 2.1 was adopted in June of 2018. You know, these WCAG guidelines, as they're known, are organized into three levels. There's level A, which is the most basic you know, level of web accessibility features. There's level double A, which deals with the most common barriers for disabled users. And there's level triple A, which is really meant for sites that, you know, that are meant to serve the disabled community. And it's level double A of version 2.1. That's the standard that you should be striving to achieve with your website. We're not going to go through all of those standards, because like I said, it could take me an hour just to go through that by itself. But if you're not familiar with the standards or we're looking for more information, you know, we've presented webinars on this topic alone. So I suggest that you, you know, click on this link and view that recorded webinar um, on the WCAG 2.1 standards, because it'll provide all sorts of information on that particular topic. And lastly, we need to make sure that we're building digital credibility with your website visitors. So how do we make sure that the website is credible um, for the people visiting the site? So obviously visitors want to read about your products and how you serve people in your community. 
and we need to include content that relates to your institution, but isn't overly promotional. And photos need to be relevant to you as well. So it's really easy to pick stock photos, but they're not necessarily relevant all the time to you. And we need to provide value, right? We talked about this earlier in the you and not the, <laughs> not the we, but visitors are giving you time. So you need to give them something in return because the longer we can keep somebody on your site means both better search rankings and mo more importantly, higher conversion rates for you. And keeping your content up to date shows people that you're maintaining your site. So maintain links, external links, you know, update your content, you know, your rates and things like that. And we'll show you what we're talking about. So building trust is first you want to avoid unpleasant surprises. So things like automatically refreshing the page, redirecting without telling people that they're going to be redirected to another page, those pop-ups that we've already talked about, those are unpleasant experiences for people. They don't like being tricked. So don't do it. Be transparent and be honest. So compliance helps, right? We're in regulated industry, so that's good. But list the terms and conditions and terms that people can understand. There's so much legalese in banking. Let's simplify it. And hidden costs and tricky offers are toxic. They're going to lose business and affect your online reputation. So, again, compliance helps. But let's just word things in terms that people can understand. And create a custom 404 page because, unfortunately, broken links are probably inevitable. You know, there's, there's technologies that we use and obviously the CMS systems that we use are great at trying to avoid broken links, but let's create a custom 404 page that, you know, gives a friendly message that you've come to a page that doesn't exist anymore and links back to your homepage, you know, with links to popular sections of your site. And I'll show you some examples. So here's an example of a custom 404 page that one of our clients uses. Yeah, you came to a page that doesn't exist, but here's how we can help you. It's got the navigation menu at the top. It's got links to their homepage or contact us and they ask a question. Right? Here's the 404 page that we use for ourselves. It's got a little bit of humor in it. You know, let us know. We'll send you a free logo product. So help us fix our own site. And here's the pros and cons to the fact that you came to a page that doesn't exist anymore. So you can have some fun with it, but it's way better than just showing that, you know, browser generated 404, you know, oh my gosh, you broke the internet page, right? So your user experience credibility checklist is first, make sure your address and phone number is visible at all times. I can't tell you how many websites I go to and I can't find the address and phone number. <laughs> it's amazing. So people will go to your website just to find your address or just to find your phone number still. So make sure it's there. Make it very easy to contact you with prominent contact links. And then when somebody does contact you online, reply quickly. Don't let those inquiries sit there for days. Use simple language, right? People don't trust what they don't understand. You want to be credible. So speak to people in the language that they speak. Broken grammar and incorrect spelling makes you less credible. I see, we see it all the time, you know, and it happens, right? It's going to happen, but when you see it, fix it. Link to external websites that reference your organization. People want to see sites that link back to you and say good things about you and that you're, again, doing things out in your communities and things like that. So link to them. It also helps SEO, by the way. Provide staff bios, 
and photos where possible. Now, there's a lot of question. Uh, I don't want to show photos of my staff. That's a security issue. I totally understand that. So show the names in the bios or the first you know, or the first name and the first initial if you don't want to show the whole name. But you can certainly provide bios and some information about your staff. And if you don't want to show all your whole staff, obviously that's okay. Show some senior staff, you know, whatever you can do. But lead lends to credibility. Like these are the people that you're gonna to talk to on the phone. These are the people, these are this is the leadership team, right? Whatever you can do there. Show photos of your offices. Again, avoid stock photos if you can. You're not going to be able to in all cases. You know, it's just going to typically what we see is when people say we're not going to have any stock photos, it delays the website project for eons. But, you know, have some local photos and have some photos of your offices because it does, you know, make a better site. Display your rates and keep them up to date. I get into this debate with clients all the time. Many financial institutions don't, right? They don't want to show their rates. And we get into it all the time. I don't, you know, you don't have to show all of your rates, you know, show a subset of them, show your best rates. But if competitors publish their rates, they're getting the business, period. People aren't going to call you if you don't show your rates. I see it. You know, well, we're just going to put our phone number there and tell them to call us for the rates. They're not going to. So show your rates. But if you show your rates, and I see this too, don't update your rates once a year. Don't have your rates updated last in 2017 because I go to websites all the time and it'll tell me rates current as of, you know, 6 17 Well, that's no good. So update them regularly. And if you don't have an easy way to update them, then call me because we can fix that. Use testimonials. They work. Video testimonials are the best. People love video. And guess what? You have the video testimonial. You can share it on social media too. Put customer reviews on your site and elsewhere. People trust them. It's what I call the Amazon effect, right? We all read Amazon's reviews. So invite people to submit reviews to Google and Facebook. We have a tool to do that too. Maintain a blog or a latest news section. This shows again that your site is constantly updated. It helps you build expertise. It helps with SEO. There's just a lot of reasons to have a blog. Make sure things work. Eliminate broken links. Make sure that your forms or calculators work. Anything that seems broken, even if it's not, will take away from your credibility. So test things. Test them, test them, test them. You get a new version of an operating system that comes out like Windows 10 and has a new version of a browser, test everything on your website. Make sure it's still working. Optimize your site speed. People aren't going to wait for you. There's things like, you know, content delivery networks and things like that that you can subscribe to that will greatly improve your site's speed. And it's important. Again, it'll help your search engine positioning and it'll make your, your users happier. And that's what it's all about. Minimize ads, eliminate those pop-ups. You know, there's nothing wrong with having some ads on your site, right, for your products and services, especially when they're relevant. But don't show them all over the place. Don't bombard people with ads. And the pop-ups just drive people crazy. Encrypt all of your pages, your entire site, with a security certificate. It demonstrates your commitment to protecting your visitors. It costs you something like $100 or $150 a year. It's not a tremendous expense. Google now expects you to have it. They're actually penalizing you in search results if your site isn't encrypted with a security certificate. So do it if you're not doing it already. That's the HTTPS. And if you are considering a website redesign, LKCS will conduct a UX review of your site at no charge. We'll prepare a presentation for you that and give it to you that you can share with your staff and board of directors. And all you have to do is contact us online or by phone, and we'll be happy to prepare that for you. So that's what I have for you. So thank you again for attending the webinar today. Um, I'll be staying online here to answer any questions for you. So feel free to type them into the GoToMeeting toolbar 
or feel free to contact me offline after the webinar, um, and I can answer your questions or get you in touch with our web development team at any time. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate I really appreciate it. And, uh, I hope the information that I provided was valuable for you.